thanks uh, Eric, David, um, Kristen for, for joining us. Thank you also Veronica, Eduardo and, and Kasia. I'm, I'm very interested in the outcome of today. This will be the first of three similar calls where we are trying to um, collaboratively and um, in the open eye develop um, a legislative proposal that we introduce in Luxembourg first, but that can then be used across the world. Uh, so it should be simply a prototype for, for law that would enable direct air carbon capture to be economically more viable, especially on a modular level. So that being said, uh, thanks, Christopher, for organizing this and uh, back to you. Yeah, and I've, um, we've, we're talking to the right people today. We want to talk about modularity uh, in, in DAC. And again, I just want to emphasize that the idea here, and, and Eric, I talked to uh, Klaus, he may have mentioned to you for about an hour about this idea. We were going back and forth between feed-in tariffs and reverse auctions, and he'll be in the last session, uh, actually. So he'll be uh, sort of on cleanup. And by that point, we'll hopefully have a more evolved idea uh, for him to uh, scrutinize and provide ideas to. So let me get right into it. And um, I'm just gonna share a little bit of background. Again, this is gonna be very much let the ideas fly. We have some questions. The key thing we wanna figure out right now as I'll get into is that, you know, renewable electricity and electricity are a lot different than carbon. And so on the policy side, in terms of the, the policy pieces, we think map on well to what we wanna do with CDR but the realities of the differences with the, the technologies of the domains are gonna necessitate obviously some differences to how we do the policy. So I think we have to ground our analysis here in what's, what are the realities of sort of modular DAC at present and in the future. And so that's what we really kind of wanna get your guys' perspectives on. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and just give you guys a, just a brief overview of our uh, sort of theory here or our sort of starting assumption or questions. And then we'll get right into the questions and we can uh, talk through them. Kristen, you're just going to have to use your, your visual imagination here. Um, so carbon fit, uh, the idea, as I mentioned, is to uh, come up with some sort of feed-in tariff inspired policy, which we think is appropriate in Europe um, because of obviously the precedent of that policy. It never really landed in, in the States in the same way. Um, and again, the goal is this is not an academic exercise. We're trying to develop a policy over the next month that we can then draft and then Sven is going to introduce and then we're going to try to promote in other countries. So we, this is an activist endeavor. Um, what we're doing is we just mentioned, we're going to do three of these sessions. We might tack on a fourth if we feel like there's other questions. We're not in a, a huge hurry. Uh, and then we're going to allow folks, uh, when we post this on YouTube, um, we'll also have a, uh, what's called Your Priorities, which is a really cool platform that allows people to submit. And I'm gonna share it with all sorts of people directly that I know too. So hopefully we'll have a good secondary audience of people responding to some of the stuff that we come up with in these sessions. And again, what's a feed-in tariff? For those of you who don't know about it, just to, you know, quickly, it's, it was a hugely impactful policy that um, drove down the cost of renewables, particularly solar. It was a demand side policy that Germany got started and then it was replicated in different European countries with different levels of success. Um, the main features of it, it allowed people to connect to the grid and sell their electricity and get preferential access. Uh, it paid them a high premium price that really tried to match what it would cost to actually cause them to uh, invest in it. Um, so there was these different tariffs, and they were for different. They were different for different technologies. So if you'd have uh, wind and solar, for instance, but also different scales of projects. So small rooftop solar was more expensive. Uh, to install than utility scale solar. So they got they would get a higher payback uh, in order to encourage that. Key piece of it, if you signed up for that, um, you knew that you could sell it for 20 to 15 years. So it, it locked you in at a certain price for a certain period of time. Uh, and then every next year when a new person joined, that rate went down a little bit. So it wanted to keep sort of both reflecting the reduction in pricing, but also to sort of push the pricing down as well. That was called digression. And then the last thing, which was incredibly important and a subject of interest for us is that uh, it was paid for. It was added on as a surcharge um, to electricity bills. So sometimes that was unpopular, sometimes that changed, but it came with a way to pay for itself. So that's the sort of the key thing, again, that had this really historic influence that I saw with my own two eyes as a person who spent 15 years in solar. This was the hugely influential. And the key drivers of success for the fit is that it created that certainty. You got the price, but then you got the long-term contract. And so that's what caused all kinds of people to come in and invest. 
And because of that certainty, it also lowered the cost of capital. Obviously, if you have the government that's sort of backing you up on this, it would allow uh, really cheap financing. Really important thing that Sven speaks very eloquently about, he did last week during our kickoff, is that it also allowed all kinds of people to participate because it allowed any real type of system, whether it was a small rooftop one or something larger, and that both uh, sped up its volume. This is a theory I know that Eric and um, uh, David both share in terms of DAC is that you get small can be fast. You can start getting out into the world and that has an impact on volume. Um, but it also, because it allowed all kinds of people to participate in it, it really made it popular uh, and it made it politically defensible over a long period of time. Um, and then the other thing is the basic structure of it, the different sort of variables could be tweaked and adjusted over time based on real events. And that was one of the things we talked to a, a fit expert, we posted it on YouTube, who gave us the sort of history of the fit. And the key part of its survival is that it could be modulated over time based on changes that happened. And that was a real important part of its survivability. And then it had the funding mechanism built into it. So that was, that was essential. Um, and we think that all of these things, sort of broadly speaking, in terms of policy mechanisms, um, can all really apply to carbon dioxide removal. Um, the key thing is, though, is obviously we're talking about utterly different sort of physical things, um, and not only physical things, but different industries. Um, you know, you had, um, you know, you had with uh, the electricity with the fit, you already had an electricity grid. People were already purchases of electricity. We're we're building the carbon dioxide removal industry as we go, and are at a very early stage. Um, but again, we think we can get these pieces in there, but a couple of things, this is where I want to start asking you guys questions. We need to sort of probe a little bit more and see if they can be uh, achieved or what are the actual limitations that may cause us to sort of reassess the ability to transfer this policy for carbon dioxide removal. And the first one, which you guys are perfect to answer and think creatively about, is this idea of what is the case for and what is our ability to and what does the near-term future look like about the ability to even democratize uh, direct air capture? It's a priority of spends for many reasons, which he can speak to, but it also, it's essential, I think, for the growth. If you have a lot of people that want to invest in it, that can, again, get that scale quickly and make it popular. So um, solar was inherently modular from the beginning. It's cells and modules, and it, that's just the way it is. DAC, the, the conversation about DAC, um, at least the narrative, less maybe the reality, is, is people tend to envision much larger scale, anti-modular types of applications. Um, so the first question I want to ask you guys is, which you, you've made before, is make your best arguments or your thoughts about why we think modular distributed DAC, at least at this phase, is, a, is this sort of key pathway maybe for DAC or a key pathway. And tell us a little bit about what you sort of think of the status of that right now. Is it, um, are you seeing this happen? There's a lot of startups in addition to your own that are sort of coming that are modular. So, so let me just stop there. And this is sort of a softball question because this is what you guys think all day long, but maybe Eric, David, and Christian, you can sort of make your case for modular DAC. I don't mind starting off this if, you, if you're okay with that, Chris. Sure. Uh, I, I think there are plenty of reasons why you want to do modular DAC. Going modular and going small scale allows you to find niche markets where the economics don't have to hinge upon a functioning support structure. Bef so before the policy comes in place, you can still reach out to a market without having to rely on, on artificial subsidies. That I, would, I think that's, it's good to keep that in mind, um, that that's, that's one of the facets that drives us towards the small scale. Uh, David, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I mean, broadly replicating the, the, same, the same message, as in like, I was just presenting earlier this afternoon at, at a, a card removal event at COD. And I've only now put sort of the things in my head on, on a slide. And maybe I'll just I'll just share it really quickly. Sure. You have these these historical examples from as, as Eric was saying, Tesla with the sort of hundred thousand dollar model S and and over time achieving that learning by doing to bring manufacturing costs down and opening up that sort of family sedan for thirty five thousand bucks and and then you've got the likes of Lonnie Solar, which are really crucial to the solar PV space, uh, becoming cost competitive with, with fossil carbon energy sources. And so how can direct air capture essentially learn lessons from, from these very recent examples uh, 
through modularity and through accessing niche markets which aren't dependent on policy like these megaton scale facilities which need essentially the taxpayer to pay for them uh, and so really it's around finding those those niche applications which you can deploy direct data capture at a profitable level for from day one and achieve that deployment to drive costs down through continuous innovation and dedicated manufacturing. Yeah. So this is the, the, the question then, I guess, which is of fundamental importance to us is that we don't, you know, when the German feed in tariff came in, there was already wind turbines, there was already solar panels. Uh, they were expensive, but they were there. And here we don't have that sort of agreement on what the sort of dominant, I guess, kind of design is for it. So I wonder if you guys could, you know, Sven doesn't want to introduce a policy for a technology that won't arrive for another decade. So in your best sense, it's unpredictable. And Kristen way in here too, as well, even on the last point, but sorry, I can't see you. That's why I skipped over you there. But what do you think where we are right now in terms of modular DAC coming online? Is it something you could even incentivize? Is there a supply that's going to be there? But Kristen, please uh, go ahead and jump in. Oh, sure. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the last point and, and maybe carry that into the next point, which I do think that probably um, David and Eric will be best suited to answer. But uh, I mean, look, with, with sort of with modular DAC, I, I guess the th there are a lot of things that get me excited about it uh, from a few different angles. And one is that like, um, well, we have one atmosphere, right? But I think about this in terms of um, where resources get built and spread around. So if you think about the world that we want to live in at scale, I think about scaling out rather than up, about the fact that we have one atmosphere and about the fact that right now, um, the impacts are not being evenly felt of climate change and the wealth that is to be generated from it may not be evenly distributed. And I think that with modular DAC, you actually get the chance to build more of this infrastructure in more places where it can actually benefit more people more people can see the wealth from it. You can actually have it closer to the supply chains that maybe we imagine we might need for people who are gonna do CO2 utilization, or it could be better co-located, right? With places where you want to inject it underground. So that's one thing. And then the other thing I think is, um, we have all of these existing supply chains that we've already spent decades building up in terms of particularly modular manufacturing. So where we don't need to put new steel in the ground, I think we shouldn't. I think we should make the best use of what we have now and leverage the existing infrastructure that we have. It's another reason I really love the modular concept. And then, yeah, David and Eric pointed this out, but there's a certain agility that you get with uh, smaller, more modular footprints in terms of innovating more rapidly and doing tighter design build test cycles around your hardware uh, and your sorbents that really sort of make me believe that, and talking about when is this going to emerge, right, that these systems are going to emerge, I think, um, at scale as we scale out rather than up. Um, much sooner, much, much faster than these giant, giant facilities. So, and of course you guys can, you guys can riff on that and take that away, but that's kind of like almost both questions in one, I think. Yeah. Oh, I would love to pick up that thread if you don't mind, okay. Chris. Please, uh, go ahead. Because the, the speed component there is crucial. We don't have that intermediate pilot stage and then the green field siding and permitting and you're looking at a 10 year horizon if you go down that, that conventional path. And I don't think that's time that any of us think that we have necessarily to get this online quickly. I also do wanna, wanna underline the differences between DAC to sequestration and DAC to some kind of utilization. If you look at the utilization space, the, the, the use cases for the carbon will look very differently. And we're going after markets where the use case already is distributed or the, the demand for the carbon is distributed. So why centralize that? Why force, why constrain yourself into a node when you don't have to? Uh, this is one of the, the underpinnings that I'm, I'm sure Klaus was raving about quite a bit when you spoke with him, Chris, but yeah. if you don't need to centralize, uh, then you shouldn't. And then you have all these opportunities for the modular and distributed operation too, which you don't have with a conventional factory, large scale industrial setting. Just jumping in there, um, I, I think one of the main questions um, and I totally love that, that everybody is convinced and, and happy that 
we should be able to do it without subsidies. And I strongly believe it is possible to do it without subsidies. And um, I'm not a huge fan of uh, subsidizing um, big corporations. And I've got a feeling that centralized DAC would, would yield those big corporations. And in the end, you, we would be subsidizing total energies and the BP and uh, Shell to, to do something they need to do anyway but the taxpayer would pay for it. Um, I think that the idea behind the feed-in tariff would be to incentivize small and very localized installations, um, a bit like solar on, on your rooftop, where a lot of people would not have thought about installing it, burned it for an economic incentive. And the incentive for individuals is quite different than for corporations. Corporations see subsidies and understand subsidies in, in the long term, but um, individuals see cash in the bank today versus maybe earning money in the long run. And, and they normally opt for cash in the bank today. Um, a lot of us are, I don't want to say economically illiterate, but at least we are not feeling, we've got no feeling for, for the economics at, at the larger scale. So, when I thought about the, the feed-in tariff, it was really to incentivize people to install modular DAC. But um, the, the question is, if tomorrow we'd have a law that says per ton of CO2 that you capture, and I'm not talking whether you reuse it or you sequester it, but per ton of CO2 that you capture, you get, let's be crazy, 150 Euro, US dollars or 120 euros. So a bit more than we currently say would be a minimum for viability. Would that lead more people to, to install it? And if so, could they ring somebody up and get something installed? And at what time horizon are we looking at to, to get something installed? Yeah, so let me just put on that because I think you're, you're right is it's, there's a strong justification for it, but we have the practical reality of the, is there going to be a supply for it? Um, so I wonder if, what your impressions are. You're both helming your own companies, but you're obviously looking around the space. And Kristen, you certainly have visibility on that as well. If this was passed optimistically next year and implemented in two years, um, would people show up to be able to, to deliver this? And we'll, we'll leave the whole what you do with the carbon thing separately, but just the modular DAC part. I mean, I was going to push back against that a little bit um, as sort of a, someone who, who strategically thinks about this every day. Um, Chris Chung, a member of the Open Air community, um, said it a lot more eloquently than I can, but essentially the, the, there is a, a difference with solar PV and, and modular DAC in that the consumer applications are very limited. And so deploying it in and around people's households, the, the benefits of modularity of DAC, I think, still apply for industrial deployment. And so, yes, it will be distributed, and, and yes, you can eliminate the ancillary costs of transportation and storage when it comes to, to modular deployments, being able to to actually co-locate your your green CO2 supply on site with end use. I wouldn't want to sell DAC modules to my dad to, to install in his garden because he drinks sparkling water, but not a ton worth of CO2 per month worth. And so you're going to have to develop a whole sort of transportation uh, and supply chain infrastructure around getting that CO2 from capture to end, end use. And so it's, it's difficult. I have an answer for that, but I don't think it's the best path. And it's not a path that Carbon Infinity are, are really looking at, to be honest. And Eric, I'm sure you'll want to respond to that. And just a quick, if I could frame it a little bit, that with a feed-in tariff, that also allowed for larger. I think it was the fact that it had a spectrum of different types of sizes. And so one of the questions I wanted to ask all of you, and, and David, you kind of just gave your opinion, is like, how small and distributed for DAC 
are, are we sort of looking here where it's still technically and economically feasible? So Eric, I don't know if you wanted to make a, you know, put any sort of detail on that. Well, I, I do kind of want to retort in saying I absolutely think there's a, a good valid point in defossilizing the gasoline supply or liquid fuels for transportation, no doubt about that. I also understand that the trickiness of, of, of uh, somehow just the logistics of dealing with a million different consumers rather than, than two or three large entities makes it complicated. But I suppose it did work with the with the residential solar in Germany. So there is some precedent for 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 dealing with this kind of large number of, of, of actors. Going to your question whether there will be people signing up in one, two years from now, I think there would. But I also think my hunch is from a political perspective, you cannot dissociate the use of the carbon. That has to be part of that equation, which, and I'd like to tee up a question for, for Sven here, or more of a statement, I would like to any kind of subsidy being in the interest of forcing a solution rather than picking a solution. That makes it all the more complicated, but, but I, I think that's a key distinction that good policy has to achieve. And the, the, the solution is lowering the carbon contents or at reducing the amount of carbon that we pump, suck, or dig out of the ground. I think we can all agree on that. And whatever that solution is, there's going to be plentiful, but policy should support a, a wide plethora of different solutions rather than going in and looking at each and individual one. Because for carbon, since carbon is such a fantastic material, it can and will be and should be used for a whole host of purposes not just sequestration or fuels or energy carriers, but building materials, plastics, well, even alcohol, uh, if you so want. So, so how, do you, how do you capture all of that without going in and, and making it difficult for some, more difficult for some solutions? I think that Chris has uh, a question relating to, to the question you just teed up for me, um, how, how we want to achieve or, or what the policy should achieve. And, I'm often um, derided in Luxembourg for, for coining the phrase um, technologically agnostic. Um, mm -hmm. We need to be agnostic um, when it comes to technology. We need to be agnostic when it comes to how we achieve it. What counts is that we achieve it. Um, I think that a part of our thinking process at the moment would be that the amount of subsidies paid out would depend on what happens with the carbon to reflect the different um, economical uh, outcomes of that. Sequestration obviously has no buyer at the moment or very few buyers. So we need to subsidize that maybe a bit more. Uh, similarly to uh, wind energy that has been subsidized historically more than, than solar. On the other hand, if you are reusing or recycling carbon, then you have an economical outcome that is beneficial for you or for some buyer on the market. So uh, our thinking process is, can we achieve a balance between supporting those? Um, and, and I'm seeing Chris's- Yeah, I'm gonna share that question. question. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Go ahead. So, so it's, it's really about which criteria should we use should it be the technology? Should it be the scale? Should it be um, anything different? So, so I see the question, I hear the question, and um, my answer is at this point, I don't know. It's rare for politicians to admit that they don't know, but yeah. this is a collaborative process. We are, we are trying to figure yeah. it out. Christy, go yeah, ahead. I no, yeah, I mean, I think uh, all of these are are great points. And when I, if I am, if I become, if I sort of put on my my tech agnostic hat, um, I do like that term. So if I put on my tech agnostic hat, I think, oh yeah, this is the question that Chris has on the screen, right? It's like, um, what are the things, what are the things that I care about? Let's, let's take these into two buckets. Let's say I have a Staples easy button and I push it and all of our emissions stopped instantly. You would still need a policy around carbon removals. The, the challenging thing around carbon removals is like right now what we're seeing from our 30,000 foot view is we have a top of funnel problem 
where there actually is more demand out there than there is supply. Part of the reason for that is what a lot of these early voluntary market adopters are doing in the carbon removal space specifically is they are putting forward, we'll call it like early revenue or aspirational revenue. So they're like, at some point, we want you to be able to deliver this many tons of CO2 for this much amount of money. You've shown us a model that convinces us you might be able to do that. So we're gonna go ahead and pay you for that now as if it's already happened, accepting the risk that you might not get there on the time frame that we've agreed. And this is kind of where we are in the removals and, and carbon capture situation, right? Where it's like, what we really need is to be able to scale these technologies. Right now we're at such a small, small scale. And what a lot of the companies that we work with are looking for are those kinds of commitments where it's like, well, you decide what metrics matter to you, right? And some of those are permanence and some of those are additionality and some of those are like, how are we actually measuring this and making sure that what we're representing is a ton of CO2 is actually a ton of CO2. And then we'll tell you what it's gonna cost us to make X or to pull down X amount of CO2 either into a product or into a removal in the next five years. And if you're going to give us $500,000 for technology A, they're going to be able to give you 100 tons. For technology B, they say they can give you uh, 1,000 tons. For technology C, they say they can give you 500 tons, right? So the things that I've seen that have worked that have actually been technology agnostic have been, here's a pool of money, say $500,000. However far that goes for you and your technology, we'll give you that money. And you tell us what to expect in terms of how many tons of CO2 that represents. I don't know if that works for policymakers or for taxpayers, but that is something that is actually driving innovation in the space and is particularly getting more voluntary buyers excited to jump on board and start basically front loading the revenue into these companies so they can scale and continue to develop their technology. Does that make sense? That's a really interesting idea that you put up. And I, I, Sven, if you had to respond to that, I want to get in front of it, but there's multiple things that you just brought up that relate to, you just gave me a new idea, which is good. Um, but you kind of touched upon a, a, a couple of other questions, but Sven, if you had something to quickly respond to that, uh, go for it. Let, let, let's create a fund that, that, that does exactly that. But <laughs> I, yeah. I think that that addresses a, a second issue, which is, um, to, to guarantee the supply side of, of the problem. And I think Kristen described it pretty well. Um, the, the fit will always be a question about the demand side or at least the installation demand. Um, um, the, the problem is we are in a not even two-sided marketplace here, but the marketplace has many more participants than, than the two. We have on the one hand companies that produce modular DAC that can be for rooftop or cellar installation, that can be for industrial install installation, um, it can be for a commercial real estate or for residential real estate. Um, on the other hand, we have those owners of those buildings or the operators of those buildings, whether it's residential, commercial, uh, industrial. And then obviously, if we decide that it's not sequestration um, or not only sequestration, we have a market site where people want to buy or hopefully want to buy that carbon that comes out, whether it's CO2 in a raw form or whether it's uh, concentrated CO2 or whether it's um, carbon and uh, oxygen already separated. So, so we will have multiple products at the end but we will have intermediary steps where we have a lot of actors coming together. So policy-wise, I agree that we need to address all of them. Um, but I think if we want to achieve something here, we, we need to focus on one of those parts. I can definitely see uh, taxpayers going a route of saying, oh yeah, I'm, I'm willing to, to pay for carbon to be removed or to be recycled, because that's what they are already doing in, in a lot of other domains. So it's, for me, it's also a political question to focus on 
the second and third part of the equation and not on the first part simply because politically it's much harder to sell innovation capital than development capital, if that makes any sense at all. Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, there's so many issues that sort of come together at that point. But if you look at the German feed in tariff, and if you remember, it was about three things. It was about increasing the amount of renewable electrons that are on the grid for the environmental benefit of it. Um, but it was also about driving down the cost of those technologies that was sold as part of the thing. And then there was the industrial development part of it. You know, So I think for us, like as a policymaker, we need to be making the case, and this is this is new thinking for a lot of people when they think about climate. Yes, there's the removal of the carbon right now, which is important, but the more important thing is bringing down the cost of the technology. So that's going to be a challenge for us because that's a little bit harder to articulate, but I think if you leave that out, then we won't be able to design it in certain ways. There are two very practical points that I would love your guys' thoughts on, but I do want to give uh, you know Kristen and David if you had anything to add uh, at this point. Well, it was more sort of thinking about a techn technologically agnostic policy mechanism. And so, so Julio Friedman and his team came out with a, something called the levelized cost of carbon abatement, I guess, last year. And so, essentially, if you target uh, an area of de decarbonization, let's call it long distance aviation and shipping, there's a, a given LCCA, levelized cost of carbon abatement, for that. And you go to the market and say, we're providing this, this tax break or this subsidy or whatever policy mechanism, mechanism that you want to use, given the, the LCCA analysis, and say whether you use third generation biofuels or DAC derived electrofuels, this is the, the money that you're going to get from us in order to decarbonize long distance aviation or shipping. And so that is one way in which to, to potentially catalyze the direct air capture economy, provided that is the most cost effective pathway to decarbonizing those sectors, whether it's aviation, shipping, concrete, uh, or greenhouses, whatever. But that's interesting. So you could almost, rather than picking the technology, pick the cost for different sectors in a way. Yeah, so, so you have a, a, an essentially a climate policy framework that sets different costs of carbon abatement prices for different industries. And then you say to, to the market, if you want to develop solutions for these industries, we're gonna give you this money per ton of, of carbon abatement that you deliver. The, the carbon accounting there might be tricky, um, and it is gonna. It would be a heavy, heavy lift, but it's it's a very, probably a very efficient and market-based mechanism in which to to achieve a, a nation's climate goal. That is an interesting way to do it, which gives me another idea. But I, I kind of want to link something that Kristen said, which kind of relates with what you said, but also to this question that I have on this slide here is that perhaps you know the feed-in tariff for energy was it did pick winners. It was not agnostic to technology. It would literally take different technologies and assign kilowatt hour prices that they were going to get paid, right? Um, so one thing that would be interesting though is that kind of almost like if I understood you, Kristen, correctly, that instead you have a certain amount of money that you're willing to pay uh, for it, but you could potentially use a tariff-like structure. Like how do we creatively use this differentiation for different types of goals? where you could say, here's about a money, but you get an adder if you are a removal versus a, uh, so you give some for neutral applications because again, the goal is to scale the technology to bring down the price, but you get an additional tariff if you meet, if you perform well in terms of, you know, you're again, uh, a removal instead of negative, if you are a thousand year permanence instead of a uh, hundred year permanence, and that's where you differentiate the tariffs, not on technology, you remain agnostic to technology, and that might be more appropriate for where we are, as we said at the beginning, where we don't know what that's going to look like yet. But if you set the right price, will they, if you build it, will they come in terms of a policy? If you set the right price, is that going to start actually giving us th these types of distributed solutions that might not have existed otherwise? Does that make sense? Like the way that thinking of the tariff less in terms of technologies, but more in terms of almost Oxford principles or other goals that you're trying to achieve? Well, I think, I think that might have been a question for Sven, but 
I like that a lot, actually. I like that framing on it um, because it's like, I also think that, again, it goes back to the, it goes back to the question of, of, of what, what do you actually care about? I don't, I don't know because I'm less versed in the policy space if it is possible to write a policy that encompasses all of these things, um, both removals at varying levels of permanence, right? And also utilization, but in specific markets, right? So are you, decar you know, this is, I feel like, uh, Chris, why you were putting together, you know, here in New York, we have the, the low embodied carbon concrete legislation. And we also have the direct air capture legislation coming on board. And then there's the low carbon fuel standard, right? So there are these policies that are kind of pointed at different sectors. Um, and I think that's because it's kind of challenging to create a policy that can do both the removals and the utilization and subsidize like technologies across that in the same way, but maybe not. But I do think it's like, it's a matter of what do you actually care about if it is a certain amount of removals and a certain level of permanence, or if it is true circularity, or maybe some combination of both. I think um, starting from there definitely makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I, I like that idea, you know, so we'll, we'll keep chiseling away at that. You know, in terms of for the just the last eight minutes that we or seven minutes that we have and Sven, I don't know if you anything you wanted to add to that, but I do think a really important part, why we're drawn to a feed-in tariff is not just for all of the features that it has and why it was successful in renewable energy. And we think that it might be able to transfer to CDR, but you also, you look at what the policy precedents are and the reference points that people and politicians understand in particular places. And that's a whole other source of value for the feed-in tariff is that it's a well understood policy that had its ups and downs, but looking back, it was, you know, extravagantly successful at doing what it said it was going to do. And so you can point at that and you say, hey, we're trying to do that for this. And Sven, I don't know, just from a political point of view, I think we can agree that that's probably one of the things that we, we like about this is just the familiarity of it, right? Yes, absolutely. So as I said before, I, I'm well aware that maybe a perfect solution exists on paper, but in the end, there are political realities on, on what is doable and what can be um, promoted across the world. Our goal is certainly not to only tailor made one legislation for one country where maybe you could get away with that very particular and very, very well thought out process, but it would take probably longer than to develop modular DAC. Um, and so the goal is to, to get the ball rolling now quickly and then look at the future what other bright minds will do with that policy at a later stage. Um, so the familiarity of the, um, the solution is definitely one of the key components. I, I think at some point Chris and I simply uh, talked on, on Zoom and suddenly he, he says, Sven, this sounds exactly like a feed-in tariff. And that's how the idea came to be. We, we actually looked at what worked in other sectors and are looking at how we can use existing knowledge to promote new ideas. It's much easier to explain an existing concept than to explain a new concept where we first need to explain why it could work. Here we can show and, and prove that it that there is already not only an MVP to, to stay in startup lingo, but we have scale-ups already in place. We know that feeding tariffs do what we expect them to do. We have proof, we have uh, empirical proof. So the question is now, can we transform the experience we had with solar to a new use case. And there are a lot of open questions and I think that those open questions, we will not address them all, but at least we have something where we can say, um, we don't need to teach a new concepts before we can put it into practice. Mm -hmm. and that's what attracts me to, to the question uh, the most. 
I just had an idea I want to run by you guys with the clothes that just kind of melds together several things that we were talking about. So, um, you know, in the concrete world, there's this battle around prescriptive and performance-based specifications, right? Where prescriptive specifications are where the civil engineers say, you have to use these ingredients in concrete specifically, and that's what I'll stamp, and then you can go for it. Where performance-based specifications say more like, well, it's got to be this strong, it's uh, 28 days, it's got, it, it's the, what you're trying to achieve with the concrete. And you could see almost a type of feed-in tariff where you would look at Luxembourg and you would say, what are these initial applications that we can certify that we think we can get done? So the one that I'm always harping on is DAC plus concrete. There's a big construction industry in Luxembourg. And, you know, you, you look at what's possible, right? And then maybe there's Eric, you know, you're generating uh, gasoline. That's a thing that can actually happen. And then you prescribe a tariff to those based on what, what you think they require for a return and you want to drive the cost down. But in parallel to that, you could do what Kristen said, where you say, here's an amount of money that we're going to start at. And if you score well along these other metrics of what you're trying to achieve around additionality or whatever, you're going to get adders onto it. So it's locking in on technologies that are known now, and those can historically be added to over time as the market evolves. But then it has this opening where it's basically saying, give us what you got. You tell us what you're going to bring. Uh, this is the amount of money you're going to get. And if you do these things in terms of these other things, you're going to get paid that. Um, I don't know. That to me sounds like an interesting, if that made any sense, but that, that, that I could see working. And I'm okay to be wrong. <laughs> but I don't know, Eric, if you're about to say something, if you're on mute. No, I, 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 I like it, but I, I want to bring back the, uh, and Kristen mentioned the low carbon fuel standard. And I think, wouldn't that be something that can be in a similar vein be implemented in a small jurisdiction like Luxembourg? Um, because that worked in the US, California has it, and it's not federally. So you can do that in a small, smaller subdivision. The question there is, can you make it nimble enough so that small actors the individual, well, I'm looking at our case, the individual individual residential homeowner, much like the PV solar, can get access from this, or does it just become bureaucratically impossible to deal with that number of people? I believe it's important to have that buy-in because I would surmise that one of the reasons why the German experience works so well in that regard is that you gain broad popular support by this because everyone could see the benefit right away. It would be ideal again, looking at my use case, you brought up concrete. If you look at fuels, mm -hmm. if the individual homeowner or owner of this device gets that support directly and it doesn't get funneled through any company, uh, I think that from a, from a public support, I think that's the most palatable way forward, yet some practical issues, of course. I think you're totally right on that. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of a, of a feed-in tariff model, though, is you're saying we have a priority that we want to let the little guy be able to participate, both on the supply and on the demand side, but you can also allow for it. And Sven, you mentioned something last week in the call. One of the realities of Luxembourg, its smallness and its internationalness could be a real advantage here. You know, it might not be as hard. You can tell me, just as a cultural sort of litmus test, like that there might be more openness to the idea that projects can be done outside of Luxembourg and get credit for it because Luxembourgers are so from so far afield. I don't know if that sounds is a simplification, but anyway, let me shut up and get your final thought on that. Yeah, yeah you're right. And then you're wrong at the same time. <laughs> Usually uh, the case. I, I, I think that definitely Luxembourg has a huge experience. And uh, when we are looking at green finance, uh, we are taking credit for a lot of projects that happen somewhere else than in Luxembourg. And uh, our stock exchange is very happy of, of listing all those green bonds and, and proving to the world that you can have green finance. And I, I think that's very important to, to, to support as well when it comes to innovation, when it comes to uh, putting or making money available to projects where the risk is better organized by the private sector than by the public sector. At the same time, um, the, the smallness of Luxembourg also allows the same advantages than we expect from modular DAC. It allows us to be very nimble and have quick turnaround times. If we see that something doesn't work or if the legislation needs to be adapted, it's much easier to get 
60 MPs in Luxembourg to review their copy than it is to get two chambers of Congress to review their copy. Yeah. Um, after having had a fight about the debt ceiling and I don't know what else. So Luxembourgish politics is normally very consensual. So once we set our aim to something, it allows us to um, be a bit quicker than, than most other countries if we want to. And so you see a lot of financial legislation coming out of Luxembourg where we are very quick and a lot of legislation where we don't really want to move being uh, deliberately slow. And I think that that is something where um, smaller countries, uh, microstates, as you like to call them, uh, Chris, um, are more nimble to action. put something like this into, um, into action. Um, and then obviously, um, currently Luxembourg has an official CO2 emission level of about 20 tons per capita. This is mostly due to um, border workers, cross-border cross workers every day. So we have about a third of our working force that comes across the border, and we have less, less taxes on gasoline than our neighboring countries. So you can think twice where those cross-border workers fill up their tank. So all those emissions are being counted towards Luxembourg. Obviously, if we can provide those cross-border workers with an air seller solution, or if we can capture their emissions at home, then obviously we would count them as well towards our goal. Or at least it would reduce our per capita emissions. So I think that there is an interest in Luxembourg to reduce not only at home, but also um, in the greater region at least. That's incredible. It sounds like Luxembourg is the the air seller of Europe in terms of nations, right? Small and fast, <laughs> I like it. Um, well, this is great. I mean, you've given me that, that, I think that was a sort of a breakthrough idea is just around the, the, we have a lot of options in how we do tariffs that don't have to be married to the way the renewable energy one, which was so prescriptive around technology. There's other things to sort of assign. So I think that was a big one, but I want, to, I want to thank uh, Kristen and, and David and Eric, and I want to also invite you guys to keep following the progress here. So our team is going to, while the uh, iron is hot, spend the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes sort of thinking through some of the themes and then work on that throughout the week. As we go to the next group, it's a relay, as we call it, a collective intelligence relay. We will modify some of our thinking based on what we heard here uh, and see what kind of feedback uh, we get. But I thought that was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Do you guys have any uh, final thoughts at all, Eric, David, or Kristen? Or? Just that uh, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement is, is crucial for Luxembourg, it sounds like, um, especially if you're, you're talking about recognizing your projects beyond your own borders. Um, I'm sure your diplomats are, are busy. Uh, in Glasgow. They are busy indeed, our diplomats and uh, our delegations that we sent to Glasgow. And I'm so sad that I couldn't make it for the parliamentarian meetings, but I would really have liked to, to be in Glasgow as well. But I already penciled in COP27. All right. Great. No, um, well, I just want to give you a shout out. Thank you for the energy you and Sven for, for actually piloting these discussions. Uh, I, I look forward to seeing what comes ahead and, and thank you for the enthusiasm and energy. Great. And I think the Pirate Party ca came from Sweden originally, right? I believe. Is that right? Well, Sven, they did, right? Now, some years ago. They did. They've been founded on the 1st of January 2006 in Sweden. And we all know on the 1st of January, we all have our best and brightest ideas. Great. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for attending. And again, we'll keep you posted. We'll uh, edit this video down a little bit and post it and then circulate it a bit more and see if we can get some, um, some people to sort of poke at the uh, discussion today and add some additional stuff to it in a true crowd fashion. But really, really appreciate it, guys. And thanks so much. Mm -hmm.